I will welcome Dr. Lisa. Thanks. Um, <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Maya. My my instructions for the introduction will be brief. <laughs> and uh, what what I'm going to do? I'd be happy to be interrupted. So really, I this talk can't just be an hour, because this is sort of the never-ending story, really. And um, when I talk about tobacco these days, I have this tendency to sort of start deep in the past and then not move forward fast enough. So let's see where we uh, end up today. And if somebody has something important to say, just interrupt me and say it. Um, so I, I'm going to talk first just a little bit of uh, background, some historical perspective. I hope in the end to get to just talking about China as a case uh, study, having worked there for many years. So let's, uh, let's see what happens with uh, time. So the first question is, how do we ever have a global tobacco epidemic? Why are we sitting here in 2018 lamenting the fact that tobacco is still the biggest preventable killer? So the answer is lies in, I think, this confluence of tobacco, cigarettes, the tobacco industry, and nicotine. I'm sort of going to go back just sort of for, for the classic epidemiological triangle. So you may or may not know that tobacco was a new world plant. Okay, so there was no tobacco anywhere before Columbus made his first voyage. Did you know that? So he learned something already. Um, there you go. So uh, he brought it back, first voyage, and I think you know the power of the plant should have been clear because it was quickly being used all over Europe, not as cigarettes. Those were to come much later, but in the form of snuff, oral products, and so on. And, and actually, if you go back there, a lot of Anthropologists sort of worked on how tobacco was used uh, by the native cult cultures in the United States. Of course, it had magical properties. It was used uh, for religious purposes, and it still um, and it still is. Uh, what happens if you get too much nicotine in you? Paralyzed, paralyzed, right? So uh, it was used, for example, by medicine men to rise from the dead. Take enough. Not too much, because then you are dead. Uh, and uh, it, so then as the nicotine wore off, the people would seemingly come back from the dead. So uh, I think everybody has seen this uh, triangle. So you know, using this for think about the epidemic. So we have the tobacco industry as an extraordinary vector, right? Making the product, marketing, pushing it. And we'll talk more about that. We have the agent. We have an environment that certainly in the past was very encouraging of smoking in the United States and remains so in many, uh, in many places. And then we have us, the smokers, and, and probably some variability in who's going to become addicted. But I think this is useful. So would you be shocked if I lit up a cigarette now? OK. And when I was in organic chemistry long, long ago and my professor lit up in class, was anybody shocked? No. My dean, when I was at the University of New Mexico, Len Napolitano, smoked. This was a long time ago. He smoked. There used to be people smoking in the hallways at uh, the Johns Hopkins, Bloomberg, not Bloomberg, School of Public uh, Health. So norms have changed. There's one age question I always ask. Who's been on an airplane where there was smoking? kind of divides out something about us. Um, but I testified in 1987 before the House Subcommittee on Aviation on having an in-flight smoking ban. And there were comments like the following. It's not possible. People will never obey. Pilots won't be able to fly. Imagine that. Um, couldn't, wouldn't be able to concentrate. And originally, there were not restrictions on smoking in the cockpit because of that. And now if you smoke on an airplane, you're arrested, right? So social norms have, uh, have changed. So, so we have this plant, and then the environment and the industry come along. And critical was the development of the smoking, uh, the cigarette-making machine, the Bonsoff uh, machine, which is this thing up here. And originally, the cigarettes were handmade. Philip Morris was a London tobacconist, in case you didn't know. Cigarettes were originally hand-rolled in factories and sweatshops, Lower East Side, 
And then the Bonzac machine came along. The industry moved to uh, the South, where the tobacco was uh, raised. And some interesting characters came along. Washington Duke, whose son was James B. Duke. You've ever seen this name attached to a university? Uh, that was tobacco money. It was Trinity University, which the Duke family uh, bought. And basically, Duke and his American tobacco company took over the world. And when I say took over the world, in the early part of the 20th century, more than 90% of the tobacco was coming from uh, Duke and his uh, American tobacco. And the world had been carved up among the uh, monopolist companies, British American taking certain parts and so on. And uh, 1913, we have Camel, the first mass-marketed uh, cigarette. So I'm just going to run through a few uh, Camel. Uh, whoops, not yet. The, the last thing, just the modern cigarette. So Jeff Wigan, if those of you have seen The Insider, the movie, he is the uh, insider. Uh, there are some interesting folks who surfaced, uh, sort of the so-called whistleblowers. But the modern cigarette um, is just a perfect engine for delivering nicotine. It's been made to do that. The, uh, there's a gram of tobacco. Since the 50s, most of them have filters, at least in the United States. The filters were ventilated with little vent holes, and that was to reduce yield when it was measured. Yield was measured by a smoking machine. What happens? Machines don't have fingers, but people do. And so the holes are blocked, and there's uh, comp compensation. So it's a, a device It's engineered to deliver nicotine, and it does it well. The lung, remember, has the alveolar, alveoli or a surface the size of a tennis court, lots of space to dump nicotine. And you know, with, with, with inhalation, the bolus of nicotine gets the brain in about 8 to 10 seconds, and people get their uh, hit. So back to the mass marketing. So this is the original Camel Pack, and it's, uh, it's terrific. So where do Camel cigarettes come from? This is not a trick question. Did they come from Egypt? No, they came from North Carolina, right? And were there, are there camels in North Carolina? Or pyramids or anything else? So here's great mark, and if you looked at the pack on the edge, it would say, don't look for premiums as the tobacco blended here or provided here is so good as to not allow us to offer premiums. Okay, so there's the original camel, and notice it says Turkish, because the Turkish tobacco, darker tobacco was considered sort of more exotic and, and, uh, and flavorful. So a triumph of marketing. So I'm just going to march us through some camel packs. There is a 75th birthday pack. OK, we're going to get to the 100th. Don't, don't worry. Uh, there's the bilingual camel. And there have been these arguments made. There are all these different camels, Joe Camel figures um, over time, that maybe there's a little sort of differences in how the camels look, depending on the group to which the camel is oriented. So Jose Camel over here is uh, perhaps a little bit uh, different. The uh, Joe Camel campaign actually was ended when litigation was brought against RJR over this uh, story about more ch as many children recognizing Joe Camel as Sesame Street characters. So think about uh, that. I, I testified for the Federal Trade Commission on this. My job was to say that. Um, Smoking was bad for adolescents, just as it was for adults. And there was an exchange sort of as follows between myself and the attorney. And it, it was a little bit of, Dr. Samet, you mean to tell me these information you've been providing us about respiratory symptoms comes from questionnaires, and no lung biopsies have been taken? And I said, gee, parents don't like it when you come into the classroom and biopsy their children's lungs, and there's this Outbreak lab, no more questions, no more questions. Um, so uh, marketing to women, OK? And some of you may remember the Camel 9 uh, campaign. It's about 10, 12 years ago now. Camel Wides, again, anything to broaden the appeal, perhaps reaching into the uh, little cigars and blunts here. Uh, all kinds of connections. So here's Camel Casino, you know, gift coupons and other things. Uh, going worldwide. Notice this pack says Turkish and American instead of domestic. So that came from Poland. Okay, and then here's another one. I'm going to show you some great ones. Here is uh, Glasnost, reaches uh, 
uh, Camel uh, cigarettes at the time that uh, Poland uh, separated. And uh, this one is fabulous. This is from Spain. That says, uh, have an intense pleasure with your camel. <laughs> Never mind. OK. And then uh, an assortment of packs from around the world. And you have to admit, when you look at these, the imagery is spectacular, right? And, and they were able to pay the best graphic designers for ever to have these kinds of uh, products. And then moving into uh, different products. And these are, some of this has never appeared. Snoof, snus is a moist tobacco product that comes from Sweden. It's like, essentially, it's moist tobacco in a little uh, pouch that goes into the mouth. It's like putting a nicotine patch into the mouth, essentially. They were coming out with these other products. I, they, they test marketed, but these things were like little Tic Tacs that delivered nicotine. Uh, there were these strips, and then there were little wooden sticks with nicotine on them. And these were a whole set of products that they were playing around with about 10 um, years ago. And the marketing was clear. So here's snooze. And the idea is basically you can maintain your addiction no matter where you are. And they have all these uh, different ideas, like on a jet, at a bar, at a club, even an overpriced tapas restaurant. Somebody was paid to think that up. Um, and then the 100th anniversary, have sort of a techie camel here. Um, picture wandering around airports. Here's M Munich. OK, notice April 2013, 100 years. Uh, so it was the 100th year uh, anniversary. Uh, and then moving on into new RJR, which was Camel, moving on to their um, electronic product, uh, Vuse. And uh, here it is, 100 years of innovation. Okay, welcome to uh, tomorrow. So they've stayed uh, alive by making products that addict and, and of course, uh, lying about what the products uh, do. And we'll come back to uh, that. So, and of course, smoking kills. Now, how do we find out about that? I'm not showing you the first study that showed shortening of lifespan by smoking. That was a paper that came from Johns Hopkins from Raymond Pearl, who was the chair of biostatistics at Hopkins and was following families in East Baltimore and published a paper in Science in the late 1930s showing about a 10-year reduction of lifespan, 8 to 10-year reduction, for what he called heavy smokers compared to non-smokers. And the interesting thing about the paper, Pearl was very bright, very productive. Uh, having shown that kind of reduction of lifespan, there's a, a next question that should immediately come to mind, which is how, why, what was the difference in mortality? And interestingly, I can't find that he actually pursued that. And it was in 1950 that this wave of papers on lung cancer and smoking, smoking and other diseases comes. The first case control studies on smoking lung cancer were probably, and there's argument about this, but at least definably two done in Germany during the Nazi era. Uh, and these have been now sort of more widely um, reported. But 1950, there were five case control studies published. The three most prominent are these. Uh, Levin, who was later on the faculty at Hopkins and described the attributable risk statistic. Uh, Winder, who did his study as a medical student at Washington University in St. Louis, with Evarts Graham, who was a surgeon, the first to remove a lung, a pneumonectomy, for the treatment of lung cancer. He smoked. He died of lung cancer. Okay, so uh, Winder and uh, Graham, and then, of course, uh, Richard Dahl, Sir Richard Dahl and Sir Austin Bradford Hill had their study in London, initial results in 1952, and the final results in 19, uh, I'm sorry, original results in 50, final in 52. And then uh, Dahl and Hill went on to start the British doctor study in 1951, a prospective cohort study of about 33,000 male physicians and another 7,000 or so female physicians. They started their study in 1951, and by 1954, they published a paper on their preliminary results, which I find remarkable, and I sort of tell every graduate student who's a year or two behind that Dahl and Hill started a cohort study of 34,000 people. Absent computers produced a paper published within 
three years. So pretty, um, pretty remarkable. But Dahl, uh, in talking about this later, said, you know, we, we had plenty of case control studies by 1951 and that prospective data were needed to quiet the uh, critics. So the evidence was quickly convincing. Now, to understand today, you have to go back and look at sort of yesteryear. In 1954, the tobacco industry began its campaign of fraud and deception that eventually led to it being indicted under the uh, racketeering laws in the United States. In 1954, they released this statement here referred to as the Frank Statement in all major periodicals in the uh, United States. Uh, the signers down here are the tobacco companies. Something new called the Tobacco Industry Research Committee, which became the Council for Tobacco Research, that funded research, and the advertising firm of Hill and Knowlton. Okay, and we'll come back to the tobacco industry playbook for discrediting science, but it roughly starts here. And in 1953, there was a well-documented meeting of the councils of the tobacco industry at the Plaza Hotel in New York, where this was all set in motion. Those of you wanting a good read about a bad topic, go read Robert Proctor's book, which is largely based on the uh, industry's documents. Robert is an extraordinary individual, sort of a true polymath who uh, has written several books on cancer control, tobacco, and but this book really stands out. And uh, among other things that Robert did was he identified the many historians and statisticians who have ended up in the last several decades sort of working as consultants to the uh, tobacco industry. So a good read, the start of a camp campaign, 1954. In terms of tobacco kills, there are several landmarks. 1962, the Royal College of Physicians said that smoking causes lung cancer. 1964, the Surgeon General's um, report, the first one. And what should stand out about this report is that it's, in my mind, one of the first systematic reviews in medicine and public health. And if you look at what they did, they set up criteria. Those of you in EPI have all heard of the Surgeon General's criteria, the Bradford Hill criteria for causation. They reviewed over 7,000 articles. They evaluated the articles. They set up criteria for reaching judgments, and they did a lot of work. So here is the press conference with Luther, um, with Luther Terry. It was held on a Saturday because of concerns about the stock market because tobacco was so important. Took a big group to do it. This is the uh, supporting uh, committee. And here's Surgeon General Luther Terry uh, holding the uh, report. All the reports are available online. So it's, it's, parts of it are worth reading, just the methods, how they set things up. So the important conclusion out of this was that smoking causes lung cancer in men, causes chronic bronchitis, associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Overall, there's a 70% increased risk of mortality for smokers. And there's actually an interesting example of a meta-analysis in the report, not called such, but it was clearly a meta-analysis. On the committee was William Cochran, the statistician, uh, who was very interested in how you put data together. So he probably did it. I'm just going to fast forward to one other of these uh, reports. The 1986 uh, Surgeon General's report, for those of you who don't know the visage of Everett Koop, probably the most famous Surgeon General, here it is. He sort of looks like a pirate, I think. And uh, I'll tell you a story. By this time, I was involved in producing uh, these uh, reports. This was sort of a forest plot-like diagram of the epidemiological data available um, then. And the conclusion of this report I'm going to show you in a minute was that involuntary smoking causes uh, lung cancer. The actual author of this bit of the report was uh, Anna Wu, for those of you who know Anna, who was uh, now one of the faculty at the University of Southern uh, California. So here's uh, the report, and this is the lead first conclusion. So involuntary smoking is a cause of disease, including lung cancer in healthy non-smokers. Second conclusion was a bunch of stuff about how smoking by parents is harmful to children. And the third conclusion was 
simply separating smokers and non-smokers in the same room does not protect non-smokers. And if you're of the right age, my, those of you who were on airplanes when there was smoking going on, you remember there used to be signs like smokers, smokers over here, non-smokers over here, and somehow there was a magic thing there that uh, was dividing. We did, we did some work in uh, Albuquerque in probably the late 80s uh, monitoring nicotine and smoking and non-smoking sections in restaurants. And very often, the nicotine concentrations were higher in the non-smoking sections in some restaurants than the smoking sections in other restaurants. It just depended on you know, the configuration and how many smokers uh, there were. So in terms of laying out the scientific foundation, it came along a long time ago. Active smoking kills sec you know, inhalation of secondhand smoke arms non-smokers, uh, you know, ranging from, you know, the unborn fetus up through uh, everyone uh, else. So the ma evidence mounted uh, over, the, uh, over the years. This is the 50th anniversary um, report. I was actually the senior scientific editor for this uh, report. This is 1,000 pages. This is 500 pages of tables and figures. This is four years of my life. Um, and I, I say that this is 330 pages. And I think the point was that by 19, uh, by 2014, the evidence on smoking disease was extraordinary. And this is active smoking. And red are the new causal associations we added in 2014. Okay? And if you think about it, here we are 50 years later, still adding to the list, and some of it you know, is, is just um, quite remarkable. So diabetes, this is from pro-inflammatory activity and other, other things. TB, okay, I, I know you have to have an infection to have tuberculosis, but in terms of the manifestations of the disease and the risk uh, increased and adding cancers. Still, and then for passive smoking, we added stroke to the list. Uh, heart, heart disease had already been there, lung cancer, and a variety of problems in uh, children and infants, including sudden infant death um, syndrome. So there's the foundation for action. Now, important to this is sort of what has happened with this uh, evidence. Uh, the uh, Department of Justice, of course, began litigation under uh, President Clinton against the tobacco industry that uh, continued uh, in the uh, Bush administration the tobacco industry was found guilty by Judge Kessler under the uh, racketeering laws, so-called uh, RICO. And one of the most recent manifestations of this was the recent corrective statements that were released about um, a year uh, ago. If you want to catch up on the tobacco story, read Judge Kessler's opinion, which happens to be 1,700 pages. Okay. And she did a remarkable job. And I think, for example, this is one of the leading uh, sentences. Tobacco industries marketed and sold their lethal product with zeal, with deception, with a single-minded focus on their financial success, and without regard for the human tragedy or social costs that success exacted. Pretty, uh, pretty poetic. Uh, make a... Uh, comment here, she heard the whole case herself. There was not a jury. And uh, I testified, I had the hard job of saying that smoking is bad. Um, and, you know, had, and, and in fact, the way this was done was that uh, I had to submit my testimony in writing as a series of questions and answers. And then I had one hour to present to the judge. And then I was cross-examined for, um, for a few and good stories to talk about in other, other contexts. But here's the Kessler opinion. Among the things the industry was found guilty on was uh, trying to uh, undermine the information on the risks of smoking, particularly secondhand smoke, which had been a real battleground for decades as the evidence came out on secondhand smoke and health. Also, the um, uh, implication that products labeled light, mild, low tar, et cetera, were somehow safer. Uh, the industry, for years, had pushed back on all the evidence, particularly attacking epidemiology. 
which kind of still goes on in many realms. I think everybody knows. So one of my favorite cartoons, these studies are inconclusive. So far, we've only succeeded in giving cancer and heart disease to laboratory humans. I testified in the one case, state case, that went to trial, Minnesota, which went on for four months and then was settled on the uh, last day. I spent about three, three days on the witness stand. One of the questions that kept coming back was, is, Dr. Samet, uh, are there any animal models of lung cancer? And this sort of kept going over and over again. It's actually very hard to get an animal to smoke the way a human smokes cigarettes. They have, we have protective reflexes. And the, uh, my comment was with millions of dead people, why do we need laboratory animals? What do you do when you run out of humans? Start using lawyers. OK, so the um, industry challenge was widespread. And I can tell you that in the 80s, at many scientific meetings, presentations by people talking about the adverse health effects of secondhand smoke or exposure were often questioned at the microphone by people who were coming from the tobacco industry. Sometimes by the nature of the questions, they appeared to be uh, lawyers, um, in fact. But the industry did any number of things to try and undermine the science. Um, causation cannot be established. That, of course, was heard for active smoking and then for passive smoking. Epidemiological studies are junk science. Anybody ever heard that in their work? It kind of continues um, on. Uh, and controversy exists among science. Some of the controversy was simply manufactured. And if you go probe deeply into the story of secondhand smoke and the tobacco industry responses, they created scientific societies. There were journals that uh, came from the uh, tobacco industry. Uh, people were, quote, consultants. Sometimes we did not know that they were actually in cahoots, if you will, with the uh, tobacco um, industry. Many of the names are out. I'll mention one, uh, Ragnar Rylander. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Rylander. who was a fairly prominent sort of occupational respiratory disease. He was the secret go-between between, between Philip Morris USA and Germany where toxicological studies were being done, and they didn't want to have anything in writing just as one uh, example. So there was a playbook that came along with all of this that I think still um, resonates. Speaking of the global issues, the tobacco industry went global in finding these uh, consultants. Lawyers were sent around the world to find people who might be the right ones, who were opinion leaders, but potentially malleable enough to deliver the tobacco industry uh, message. People from the US and other places were sent to low and middle income countries to bring these kinds of uh, misleading uh, messages. So the industry playbook is still with us. And whatever you know, the chemical or the exposure may be, and particularly if concerned about hazard and risk comes from epidemiological studies, very likely to see sort of the rolling out of what happened with active smoking and uh, secondhand smoke. Uh, some of the same types of people uh, and some of the same people, in fact, are involved in, started with tobacco and moved on to other issues. This has been very well chronicled. There's a whole series of books at this point. Uh, the Merchants of Doubt, Doubt is Their Product. There's just a, probably about 10 of these now, and, and many of them take the playbook back to um, the tobacco story. In fact, there were people who were involved with the secondhand smoke story who then moved on to climate change and uh, creating doubt uh, there. So that's uh, important. So with a half hour gone, we're up to the rest of the world. OK, so the epidemic goes global. So this is very stylized. This is, uh, came from Alan Lopez, Michael Toon, Richard Pito, and others about the idea of how the tobacco epidemic unfolds over time. And if you think back and make this, let's say, the start of the 20th century. This could be the United States with rising smoking and rising deaths from tobacco-caused uh, caused diseases. Start of the 20th century, 
biggest killers in the United States, tuberculosis and other infectious uh, diseases. So a very different picture from now. A cresting of the epidemic here in about 1960. I'm going to show you some more of that in a bit. And now, actually, smoking falling, of course, smoking, and many of the smoking-related diseases beginning to fall. In fact, the only one that's not falling and somewhat mysteriously going up or a little bit stable is uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, but, of course, heart disease has been an incredible success. And lung cancer rates are falling, particularly in uh, younger men, beginning to fall in younger women, and uh, stabilizing, at least, in women going down for about two decades in men. Yes? Right. Yeah, so uh, great, a great question. And so there's really, when people stop smoking with regard to heart disease, there's a relatively immediate gain, roughly a 50% reduction or so in the risk of dying compared to uh, non-smokers, probably coming from a couple of the acute mechanisms by which smoking affects risk for heart disease. So one is uh, effects on fibrinogen and other parts of clotting, making people more likely to clot platelet adhesiveness. Autonomic uh, system, nervous system uh, effects, predilection to arrhythmias, possibly. So those are carbon monoxide, of course, going away. So those are the postulated acute mechanisms. And then, of course, smoking contributes to atherogenesis, and uh, there may be some improvement. I think the answer about how the longer-term risk changes depends on age and cessation. Uh, and how long you look. So I think, you know, a, a year is optimistic in terms of the current epi studies as to when the extra risk goes away. I mean, we've talked about five or ten years, perhaps. But there is that immediate reduction that fits very well with the mechanisms by which we think smoking contributes to um, heart, um, heart disease. The uh, lung cancer risk, of course, takes a longer time. And from what we know from long-term studies, it never gets back to what it would have been had the former smoker not, uh, not smoked. Um, this could be countries that came along somewhat uh, later, Mexico, Brazil. Much of the world, fortunately, is still down here. In sub-Saharan Africa, rates of smoking among men are around 8 to 10 percent. And here, the emphasis is on not repeating what is an entirely predictable uh, experience. So this is uh, schematic uh, but useful, and you can see how this is 20, more than 20 years ago. They keep sort of updating this. Things fit for different, uh, for different countries. Uh, we have good surveillance in place, relatively good surveillance in place. There's something called the Global Tobacco Surveillance System. This is sort of CDC, WHO collaboration. The Global Youth Tobacco Survey has been in progress for a long time. With the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control came the Global Adult Tobacco Survey, or GATS. And there's a couple of other surveys um, going on. But these two give a pretty good picture, and I'm going to show you some plots of what's happening in the world. This is uh, the first paper we actually did from GATS, published in uh, 2000. 12, and there's just, it's a remarkable figure to me uh, because of the variation. So what are the patterns? So men almost everywhere smoking much more than women, possibly speaking to social norms around women smoking versus uh, men. In the United States, Marlboro was originally a woman's cigarette. The tobacco industry during the suffragette movement was clever, evil enough to seize on to women's rights as an issue. They organized parades of women marching on Fifth Avenue smoking. Okay? So uh, cultural norms are different. And we'll take, hopefully, a, a look at China. In India, of course, uh, use of oral products is very common among uh, women. Uh, and, but you see this male predominance, and, and a great deal of variety in peak prevalence. 
across, uh, across the world. Okay, so we'll come back to what these figures look like. So we have surveillance in place, and I'm sorry, here's that map uh, I promised. Okay, and here's uh, China, where still a, a, almost a majority of men smoke. Russia, where there have been these extraordinary surges in mortality as alcohol consumption and despair have uh, crept in. South Africa, a little bit different from the rest of sub-Saharan uh, Africa. Argentina and Chile, much greater smoking than uh, the rest of uh, South America and Central America. There's clearly a very different pattern of smoking there. That's in men. Women, notice the color change. Okay, so a lot less smoking among, um, among women. And again, here you can see Russia and some countries in Europe uh, standing, uh, standing out. Now, if you look at the burden of disease, uh, and, and again, this is just a map of Daly's disability-adjusted life here is lost. It, of course, reflects the pattern of smoking. Smoking remains among the leading causes of preventable death. These uh, attributable risk burden of disease exercises um, are very valuable Embedded in all of them is a counterfactual, okay? What you're making the comparison to of the world as it is, the counterfactual for smoking is no smoking. Makes sense. What's the counterfactual for obesity, and is it achievable? Uh, take a look. Could there be a demarcation of BMI at 25? Don't think so. Or if you look at air pollution, it's a very low value. So I think these are real targets that we could hopefully achieve. And then deaths, okay? And, and again, of course, the map follows. Females, still a very important cause of death um, globally. And then uh, this is an epidemic where there are some very high burden countries, okay? And I think this is now absolute numbers. So China with roughly 300 million, give or take, you know, some millions smokers. Okay, so the figures are incredible. We're doing pretty well at 40 million, okay, and we're still important. Indonesia, uh, India. Okay, and again, wide, uh, wide variation, and countries progressing at different rates. So let me turn to then, here's our big problem, something to do about it, and turn to sort of the global tobacco control landscape. So back to the U.S. first. Uh, this is cigarette consumption per adult, whether smoker or non-smoker, 18 years and above, per year. Peak is over 200 packs per year per adult in the United States. So think about that. So cigarette burns for 10 minutes. If you smoke a pack a day, you need 200 minutes of burn time. Getting harder to achieve you may know the term chain smoker. These were individuals who took their cigarette that was about to go out and lit the next one. And in my early days in pulmonary medicine, I would see people who were smoking two or three packs of cigarettes a day. Very hard to do now because of norm changes. Okay, so if you're going to smoke three packs a day, that's 10 hours of burn time, which would be hard to achieve, I guess, unless you were just sitting in front of, I would say, TV, a handheld device, and smoking uh, away. So why did things change? So if you look going up, here, here comes Camel and everything else. World War I, things picked up. World War II, a lot of women began smoking. And then you see the evidence coming out. You see the Surgeon General's report, the movement towards clean indoor air, higher taxes, the development of therapies, uh, nicotine replacement therapy coming along in the 80s and uh, 90s, early 90s, and so on. So many, many things led to change. And when we began to look globally at what to do, there was already some knowledge of what policies might work, what the basics should uh, look like. Critical to current global tobacco control is the framework convention on tobacco control. So this uh, came into force in 2005. WHO has the right to make treaties, and this was the first treaty that WHO did. 
you might notice this is actually a little bit out of date. There are more nations. I think we're up to 181. I've got a map. The U.S. has not. We signed, but we have not ratified. And Indonesia has not signed or ratified. And it's a country where there are many smokers. And the tobacco industry is very powerful. So let's see, we're up to 181 parties, 168 uh, signers. And those who have signed and ratified belong to something called the Conference of the Parties that develops uh, protocols for implementation of the provisions of the Framework uh, Convention. And they may relate to taxation, secondhand smoke, dealing with farmers, many other uh, things on the supply and the uh, demand uh, side. Now, also important in this have been, I think particularly uh, Mike uh, Bloomberg uh, and Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation to a lesser uh, extent. When uh, the Framework Convention was passed and countries began to implement it, there was a tremendous lack of capacity uh, around the uh, world. The initial funds from Bloomberg, let me see if I can get this right. I, I think it was $350 million and another, either 350 or $500 million from Bloomberg and another 200 or so from um, Gates. A lot of the money went into capacity building. It went into educating journalists. It came, went into helping lawyers and other policy people have the resources they uh, needed. It built capacity at the um, government uh, levels. Uh, this started while I was at uh, Hopkins, and our group was dealing with a lot of the capacity building and had a focus on China in particular. It was actually, I was at the uh, press conference where uh, Gates and uh, Bloomberg made their announcement about the funding, and we had about 70 or 80 trainees from around the world with us. And I have to say they were, they were the most excited group of people I've ever seen. They all were taking pictures on their cell phones and then dashing them out to send them, or dashing out to send them around, the, uh, around the world. So I give great credit, uh, and these commitments have been uh, renewed. And of course, the money that they have put up is a lot of money, but set in the face of what the tobacco industry has and spends, it's far less. Part of the, um, uh, of the impact of the Framework Convention is coming through what WHO calls its Empower uh, Package of Interventions. And this Empower comes after the first initials of these different components of this package. So I'll show you this. So M is Monitor. And as I showed you, we have the Global Tobacco Surveillance uh, System. And this is the extent of the world covered by monitoring. It's a little deceptive because the United States, for example, is not here. We have very good tobacco surveillance, but we're not doing exactly what WHO says to be done through uh, the GATS, the Global Adult Tobacco Survey. So monitoring, protecting people against secondhand smoke. And again, this is a map of places with coverage complete national coverage of secondhand smoke. Again, you may notice that the United States is not in blue. We do not have a national law covering smoking in public places and workplaces. There was a, an effort to have such provision under a general coverage of clean air, of indoor air by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration in 94, but for a number of reasons that came to, uh, came to an end. So you can see there's still work uh, to do. Uh, China, of course, still a work in progress. But, so that's protect. Offer, this is offering to help people quit. And again, you can see here in many places there's insufficient coverage of cessation, um, let's say cessation services. In the United States, it's a patchwork of coverage depending on insurance uh, coverage and, uh, and so on, as, as you probably know. So that's offer. Warn, we'll come back to this, about the dangers of tobacco. And again, uh, this has to do with uh, having effective uh, warning labels. Certainly our warning labels in the United States are small, tired, worn out, and uh, <laughs> ineffective. And FDA has yet to institute graphic uh, warnings after being blocked in the courts first go-round. 
Uh, and uh, then, uh, I'm sorry, this is warning, and this is uh, mass media campaigns, a lot of which has been done. And then enforcing bans on tobacco advertising, promotion, and sponsorship. Okay, and again, this has to do with things like the Formula One cars that used to be covered with Marlboro, Winston, and other tobacco ads. And again, here there is work uh, to be uh, done. Certainly, Philip Morris, other companies have been major sponsors of the arts in the uh, in the in the past. Or think about Cool Jazz Festival, K O O L after the uh, cigarette. And then finally, raise raise taxes uh, and <clears throat> taxation. Higher taxes are very very effective. Kids are less likely to smoke. People are more likely to quit. Colorado, our tax is 84 cents, I think, a pack. Clearly not enough. New York and other places you get up into $4 uh, plus. Okay, so there we're not doing as well as we could. It's the cheapest, in a way, the cheapest intervention we have in our armamentarium. And then <laughs> the tobacco industry has not gone away, by the way. And they uh, have new product lines, electronic cigarettes, They've tried to block innovations like plain packaging in Australia using trade and intellectual property agreements. Uh, they continue to create doubt and um, controversy. So packaging is important. You've seen all those beautiful camel packs. It provides a message, a brand, an image. Australia went to plain packaging a few years back. If you go into a store in Australia, the cigarettes are behind a they're in a cabinet, they're behind a plain door. The prices of the brands available are posted, and all the packs look the same and carry a graphic warning. So these are some of the packs. Okay, and uh, this has been posed. So far, the uh, industry has not gone anywhere. And then in Uruguay, uh, they uh, went to single representation of a brand. So in the United States, it's 20-ish Marlboro brands, and in Uruguay, there's only one. There can be only one. And again, the Uruguay has 4 million people. The tobacco industry sort of unleashed its lawyers uh, on Uruguay. And again, Bloomberg said he would help any of these countries with legal support in terms of the, to uh, combat uh, this. And then just sort of one of the latest twists, this is uh, the Philip Morris Foundation for Smoke-Free uh, World that appeared earlier this year. It's led by uh, Derek Yock, uh, who uh, was a very important figure in tobacco control in South Africa, led the Tobacco Free Initiative uh, at WHO under uh, Brundtland, uh, was there when the framework convention was signed. <clears throat> and now is involved with this uh, Philip Morris Foundation, which is uh, receiving $80 million a year times 12 years. And uh, our school was among um, the 1920 that signed a letter saying that we would not accept funds from Philip, um, Philip Morris. So we have an editorial about to be out about this. So there's that story. Here's just a recent meeting organized by The Economist on learning from disruption. And down here is Derek. So um, and then, of course, the wrapping up uh, of tobacco into the general problem of non-communicable diseases. And again, there was a high-level UN meeting on tobacco and a follow 2011 one follow-up meeting and tobacco as a major risk factor. So I think that's that, but if you give me five minutes, I'll, we'll dash through China, or we can just talk. China, okay, all right, China, all right. So the China story. So. Let me just say, how do these things um, happen? So I, for those of you in global health, if you don't know Carl Taylor, you should. Who knows Carl Taylor? So Carl started the International Health Department at Hopkins and was sort of a pioneer in this whole space. Very interesting man. Grew up in India as a child of missionary parents, made it to Harvard Medical School, Harvard School of Public Health. And uh, I have, was the UNICEF representative in China. Uh, and he's the person who sort of motivated me, asked me to go to China uh, at the start of 1995, shortly after I went to um, Hopkins. 
China was going to host the 1997 World Conference on Tobacco in Beijing, and they wanted to make some progress, the Minister of Health, Cheng Mingzhan, who was his friend, um, and do a survey of tobacco smoking in China. So I went, and uh, I'll tell you about the story. About that time, the tobacco industry was eyeing China. This is the Marlboro Cowboy. It says, speak Chinese. Okay, and the potential of the market was being, uh, was being realized. And this is actually the time when our U.S. State Department was sort of aiding the uh, tobacco companies as they made their inroads into uh, countries around the, uh, around the world. When I went, um, I met uh, this woman, uh, Yang Gong Wang, who was the person doing tobacco control for China. She had a budget of maybe $20,000 a year for the country, okay? And uh, she was charged with doing the national survey and organizing the, um, the, the meeting. Uh, you might notice that here many years later, she's deputy director general of the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the Chinese CDC. She's actually now uh, re retired, but I came back and uh, looked for funding uh, for doing the 1996 national survey and getting some help into the meeting. And uh, that all worked, uh, worked out. Let me skip this. Uh, just a reminder where China sits. And the concern with this, of course, is how many avoidable deaths there are here, and what a target these non-smoking women are uh, for the uh, tobacco industry. So there is that, okay, so a, a target. So, and then as time has continued, I think there's, a, there's some good news. There's been a trickling down of the percentage of current smokers in China, and luckily, so far, smoking among women has stayed down. Okay, so that is uh, is good. And there's 53% males and still that low percentage of women. And the more recent data support this. Secondhand smoke exposure is totally widespread. China is the largest producer of cigarettes. China National Tobacco, the state monopoly, is the biggest tobacco company in, uh, in the uh, world. So, there's a real problem. So you have the Chinese government where tobacco is still a substantial part of the revenues, 6 7% perhaps. Uh, it's in several of the provinces, it is critical to the income, for example, Sichuan, uh, based on uh, a leaf tax. So it's a very complicated problem. I was in a meeting about four or five years ago with one of the uh, high-level think tanks where they were trying to look at options. How do you get out of this? Uh, how do you get out of killing your citizens to make money, particularly at a time of um, health uh, reform. The, uh, this comes from a burden of disease paper for China. My colleague, Yang Gang Wang, here is the first author. And again, you can see uh, tobacco smoke sitting very high and uh, contributing to disease uh, burden. Big surprise. And we um, had a paper uh, about this same time coming from some of the other cohorts in China on the number of deaths trivial, just an enormous burden of uh, disease. The tobacco industry there, like everywhere else, does interesting things. They've sponsored schools. Um, they have uh, sponsored other kinds of activities. Interesting things, so here, for example, is cigarettes you buy, you are contributing a bit of kindness to Project Hope. This has a special medicinal additive technology one of these uses, quote, Chinese herbs to make clean, clean up the free radicals and make things um, healthy in the uh, cigarettes. Gift giving is uh, an important part, has been. I think it's lessening now. We, we're working with um, Fogarty funds in China. Uh, one place where people give cigarettes is gifts, weddings. And we tried to get a couple to have a smoke-free wedding and so we could do a media event about it. It took a while to get a couple to agree um, to that. So, uh, oh, and just, uh, I mean, again, my colleague Gong Wong, I'm quite uh, pleased with many of the things she's done. A tobacco scientist was elected to the Chinese Academy of Sciences because of his work on medicinal 
uh, herbs, and my colleague uh, Gong Wang sort of uh, outed this whole uh, shameful story about his receipt of uh, reward. So I think uh, China's made a lot of progress. There's a huge amount of progress to be made. And I think you talk to anybody who comes back from China, they may say, be amazed by the smoke. And the only thing I can say now with the 25-year perspective, it's not as bad as it used to be. And I can remember sitting in the old airport in Beijing under signs that said no smoking, and everybody simply sitting there smoking. And you know, we asked the waitress about it, and she just shrugged her shoulders because it was impossible to deal with. But some norms are really, really changing. This book actually just came out. I haven't read it yet, Poisonous Pandas. Uh, the panda here is not this guy smoking away, but uh, the cigarettes, the panda, uh, the panda brand. So that's a little bit about um, China. And the one thing I'll say is that the, you know, the epidemic and the challenges obviously differs from country to country, place to place. And I think what the FCTC does is it gives a package to the countries to use. And then I think the uh, support from Bloomberg and Gates has really been uh, critical in some parts of the world. So I think we have three minutes left for questions. And if we're running out of here, we'd be happy to talk to anybody afterwards. So thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to tell a long story. Yeah. Thanks. Well, obviously not yet. And, um, you know, the current um, prime minister, premier, president, whatever, I always get the title wrong, but um, his wife apparently is very interested in uh, tobacco uh, control. The Ministry of Finance has held all the cards on this. Um, and I think things have improved a bit. The meeting I was at, there have been some writings now about this, exactly what you're getting at uh, Lisa, but it's it's been a huge um, a huge problem. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and and, a, and of course, in a way, if and we'll have to see what happens as they continue to advance their health care. In a way, if you in the past, if you didn't have personal resources, there was no therapy. And you know, if you look at the different diseases, so lung cancer, I don't know what survival is in China, but it's about 15, 16 percent of five years here. And anybody wanting probably surgery or therapy, or even a diagnosis, I suspect, in rural areas had to have uh, resources. It, these are clearly externalities that are being visited on the people right now and less on the uh, and less on the uh, on on the government, and that was you know certainly in the U.S. the the costs of healthcare delivery for tobacco related caused diseases was important in the litigation and the Department of Justice um, case. The accounting there, I think, is just much more problematic. Well, I, you know, I think we're going to have to say, I mean, and that's going to vary by country. And the U.S. is going to be unique because we have regulation by the FDA and an announced policy of driving nicotine down to push people to alternative products. In the U.K., the, the use of e-cigarettes is very patchy around the world. In the U.K., they're being pushed as a harm reduction uh, device uh, with a belief, at least, that kids are not particularly at risk in the U.K., they're being well used in other places, Korea, Japan, they're very prominent. Elsewhere, they are not. And I, I think that looking at e-cigarettes, as FDA is trying to do, whether on the right track or not, we'll find out, it has to be part of a really holistic nicotine policy. Uh, and that, I think, is, uh, is really important. You know, we were doing really, at least in the United States, so well for so long with that continued slow movement down of current smoking, uh, 
And now what we have is large numbers of youth at least exposed to nicotine because they are vaping and or also using cigarettes. And probably as you know, the total number of kids exposed to nicotine has gone up. Big problem. John? Yeah. Well, I was struck by the wide range of problems with drug addiction. And I wonder if there's opportunity in this room for the professors and researchers and scientists that talk to them and people in the academia to say, are there any excuses for the drug addiction? Yeah, I, well, and maybe successes and failures. I mean, I, there's some things that I've always wondered about and things that you may be aware of, for example, like the pattern of smoking among Latino persons across Central South America and the U.S. of lighter smoking. Why? In the face of the same exact exposure. Uh, or, as you say, some of the successes and failures. I chaired the meeting where we, at WHO where we designed GATS, and I began with a letter to, fake letter to Mike Bloomberg in which we talked about what had happened over 10 years with all the money he had spent. And the question was, how were you going to get exactly what you're talking about and uh, piece together the story with the right, you know, super multi-level model and so on. So I, I, think, I think the answer is yes, there should be something we can learn there and hopefully we'll be able to do it. It sounds like there's a class out there. We can talk outside. <laughs>